Thank you. Good evening. My talk is a call to arms. Today's most pressing societal problems are highly complex. Climate change, world hunger, access to clean water and medicine. Let me get a show of hands. Who in the audience is working under the umbrella of one of these grand challenges? So it looks about 25% of us are these overachievers. Wonderful. Today, I want to point one way forward for you and for anyone interested in solving complex problems. As you know, one reason why they're complex is that they span multiple disciplines, from human psychology to economics to physics. To solve these problems, I believe we must break down traditional disciplinary boundaries. We must collaborate outside our own field. Unfortunately, researcher has, researchers are hesitant to collaborate outside our own fields. After all, we're specialists, expanding the frontiers of knowledge by going deep into one area. But I believe that if we apply our expertise to the broader dialogue, we can have a much greater impact. And so, Tonight, I'm going to tell the story of interdisciplinary collaboration as I see it. First, we combine expertise, pooling our knowledge and talents. Then, by combining multiple perspectives, we may be able to innovate better than any one individual. And finally, we can broaden our impact, not only to our colleagues, but also hopefully to the wider world. To tell the story, I'm going to use as a case study my current research on artificial photosynthesis. I collaborate between two labs, a chemistry lab in Cambridge and a physics lab at Imperial. Erwin, James, and I are motivated by the grand challenge, how will we power the planet in the future? Currently, our society runs on fossil fuels that pollute our planet and the air we breathe. So when they run out, and hopefully before that, we'll have to switch to alternatives. Most alternative energy technologies um, nuclear, wind, solar, these provide electricity. But many of our vehicles can't run on electricity because today's batteries aren't energy dense enough. That is, if you put batteries into a plane, they weigh the plane down more than they power it. And so the question we want to answer is, can we devise an energy source that is dense enough to replace fossil fuels? And can we do this renewably? Fortunately, nature provides a solution to this question. In the lab, we're doing research to create an artificial leaf, a device that copies nature's brilliant idea of taking sunlight energy and transforming it into fuels. So to tell our story of collaboration, let me take you back in time to 2010, when Irwin first started thinking about this problem. To gain inspiration, he outlined what it is that plants actually do. And this you know, it's photosynthesis. They take carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, and they give off food, which is just putting the energy into a solid form, a physical form known as a fuel. And so to mimic this process in the lab, to create an artificial leaf would be to achieve a holy grail of science. Erwin's next step to create a prototype artificial leaf was to map, would be to map this scheme into the simplest fuel possible. And that fuel is hydrogen gas. It's a transparent gas like the air we breathe. Ultimately, artificial leaves would incorporate carbon to create more energy-dense liquid fuels that could be used in transport. So, how to turn sunlight into hydrogen? Well, Erwin put his expertise to use. Erwin and I are both chemistry researchers. Chemistry researchers think about molecules, and here's an example of one. I kind of think, I've always thought they look like Mario Goombas. <laughs> <laughs> and just like the Goombas, molecules are characters with unique behaviors. And knowledge about these behaviors allows us to make new molecules, to design plastics and drugs. Um, here's another molecule, and it's the one we want to make, hydrogen fuel. You see it's just two single hydrogens attached together. And so Erwin, using his knowledge of molecules' behaviors, designed a catalyst, a small machine, that would attach two single hydrogens together. Here's the catalyst that Erwin and his team at Cambridge built. Um, they dropped it in a glass of water and they found that it worked. It took two single hydrogens from water and using sunlight energy, transformed them into hydrogen fuel. But then they could go no further. Erwin wanted the catalyst to absorb more sunlight. But in order to do so, he had to figure out exactly how the catalyst worked at the, the physics level. 
And so that's where James enters the story. James is a physicist with an ultra-fast laser. <laughs> I know, this is really exciting. Um, it, it may be the reason why I came to the UK. Okay. Um, James imagined that he could use the laser to understand the properties of catalysts that are triggered by sunlight. But at the moment, his laser platform was empty, so individually, Erwin and James were both stuck. When they collaborated, James and his postdoc, Anna, used the laser light as a substitute for sunlight, shining it on the catalyst. Behind the catalyst, they put a detector that would pick up the optical signals the catalyst gave off, essentially the high-definition shadows. And using these shadows, they were able to understand exactly how the catalyst works. So in this first stage of the story, Erwin got to use James's physics expertise, and James was eager to apply his laser. So by working together, they were able to make strides towards solving the overall problem. Having figured out how the catalyst worked, James and Irwin realized that in order to absorb more sunlight, they needed to expand their design and therefore their team. They hired students and postdocs with a variety of expertises. I joined the team in 2012 um, because I wanted to contribute my background in solar energy. And I'll be honest, I wanted to play with a laser. <laughs> And, and also learn the physics behind how it works from the experts. Within a year, the team developed and tested the main component of an artificial leaf, a breakthrough. And this was only possible because we used three different, uh, we combined best practices from three different areas of science. First, the photophysicists, the experts on light absorption, designed a dye, just like the dye that makes your genes blue, it absorbs visible light. Second, the electronics gurus were in charge of transferring the energy from left to right, and they chose a semiconductor, which you can find in the, um, the circuits, for example, in the cell phone in your pocket. Finally, the chemistry researchers incorporated their catalyst into this overall design. And so what does this look like in the lab? This test tube contains the green artificial leaf component dissolved in water, and when we shone light on it, within seconds, you see these hydrogen bubbles appear. They arise to the top, and you can capture them to use them as hydrogen fuel. So the second part of the story, um, it reminds me of an old saying, two nerds are better than one. <laughs> Using their individual expertise, our team members um, were able to gather ideas from their respective areas of science. And together, we assembled them to create something beautiful and novel. Ultimately, artificial leaf devices um, aim to create liquid fuels that could be used for transport. But even the hydrogen-producing artificial leaf has a role to play in society. Such a device would be able to supply the energy demands of households in rural areas, especially in areas that don't have access to the electricity grid. Here's how it works. First, the machine takes water and sunlight and makes hydrogen. Like a battery, hydrogen is a form of indefinite energy storage, so it can be used when it's needed. To use hydrogen, it's loaded into a fuel cell, which is a currently available device that transforms hydrogen into electricity. And with electricity, well, as we learned from Hans Rosling earlier, Electricity is power. As you know, energy provides a pathway toward many of the other development goals, providing access to resources that we often take for granted in the developed world. So this global vision for the artificial leaf leads us to the third opportunity for interdisciplinary collaboration, the chance to broaden our impact. We're each working on a single crucial aspect of a larger picture that it's easy to lose sight of when isolated in the library or the laboratory. But by working with other researchers, engineers, entrepreneurs, even policymakers, we can more clearly see the path that our work can take toward impacting other fields or even the wider world. I know that we can tackle grand challenges through collaboration. One day, three years ago, I decided to dedicate my research career toward helping solve the energy crisis. Since then, I've had the privilege to work with many creative scientists, collaborating across disciplines, 
on projects ranging from energy-efficient smart windows to flexible next-generation solar cells. But what most scientists fail to mention is that science is a process of continual disappointment. I can't tell you how many times my experiments went wrong and I felt like a failure. I know I would not be standing here in front of you today if it weren't for the amazing supportive mentors who showed me that failure is a necessary part of discovery, who showed me how to extend beyond the comfort zones I set for myself, and who helped cultivate the collaborative mindset I have today. So in order to share them with you, I asked my mentors what advice they would give to young researchers on how to collaborate. Nikolai advised to think broadly about questions in the world. Find whatever challenge you're passionate about, not just the small hole that needs to be filled in your own discipline's knowledge. Emily taught me never to be afraid to ask questions. <laughs> to grow as a researcher, you have to always be open-minded and ready to learn concepts from other fields. And finally, Jeff reminded me that interdisciplinary collaboration is a lesson in humility. We have to check our ego at the door in order to work with experts in another field. But when we do that, when we leave behind institutional politics and, and disciplinary barriers, we can come together toward a common goal. And so, in keeping with today's TEDx theme, I envision a panorama of great minds that is more innovative than any single individual. A thousand nerds is better than one. I invite you to be a part of this global team, and together we can meet the challenges of our generation. Thank you.